This chapter 2 analyzes a number of typical uses of commodity derivatives by corporates, investors, and other parties. Derivatives on commodities, typically settled in cash on a net basis, are used for many of the same reasons and in many of the same ways as derivatives on FX, interest rates, and equities. Institutional investors use commodity swaps to rebalance portfolio allocation towards a heavier exposure to commodities given the favorable risk-return diversification benefits commodities are often touted to have. Retail investors purchase principal protected structured notes that give them synthetic exposure to a commodity, basket of commodities, or chosen commodity index. Corporates use commodity derivatives to eliminate the price risk of their commodity purchases in the case of consumers and sales in the case of producers and to improve their ability to budget costs or revenues going forward. Directional traders use derivatives in OTC or exchange listed form to go long or short commodities through forwards, futures and options. Long short speculators and hedge funds take opposite positions in two different commodities or in two grades of the same commodity or involving the same grade of the same commodity but for delivery on different dates in the future if they perceive an imbalance between the two which they believe will not last indefinitely. In short, commodity derivatives involve many of the same instruments, strategies and risks as other types of derivatives in addition to one or two that are specific to this asset class. Forwards, futures and swaps on many commodities exist, often offering substantial liquidity and reaching tenors of considerable length. One area of significant activity in commodity derivatives involves spreads between the prices of different commodities. Refiners, for example, are typically long the price of the refined products that they produce through the so-called cracking process, which distills crude oil into outputs such as naphtha, kerosene, and heating oil, while being short the price of crude itself. It is therefore not sufficient for the refiner to hedge future profits by locking in or capping the price of crude, nor by locking in or purchasing floors on the refined products alone. Hedging only the price of the input or output leaves the refiner exposed to unfavorable swings in the price of the other item. Hedging both via separate derivatives is one option the refiner can pursue, but this becomes very expensive, particularly if the refiner uses options rather than forwards, since volatility is substantial and drives option prices often to unattractive levels. A fairly liquid market has therefore come to exist for derivatives on the so-called crack spread, a term used to denote the difference in price between the aggregate basket of products produced by the refinery and the price of the crude used in the distillation process. The crack spread is customized typically to reflect the particular output of the refinery in question, with a typical definition being something like crack spread equals 25% GL plus 12.5% N plus and so on, and over at the end minus B, where GL is the price of gasoline, 
N is the price of naphtha, GO is the price of gas oil, F is the price of fuel oil, JK is the price of jet kerosene, and finally B is the price of Brent crude. A refiner then uses classical hedging strategies for either locking in or putting a floor under the value of this spread, typically by either selling the spread forward or by purchasing put options on the spread to retain upside but eliminate downside exposure beyond the strike of the option. We turn next to a description of the role strategy mentioned at the closing of chapter 1. The role strategy seeks to exploit a curve in backwardation quite often that of crude oil, and involves quite simply the purchase of crude under a forward contract and its subsequent resale in the spot market at the expiration of the forward contract. Assume for example that crude is trading at 100 in the spot market and that the three month forward lies at 95, evidencing a typical backwardation. An investor with 100 invests this money in T-bills, assumed here to yield 5%. Purchases crude at 95 under a three-month forward or futures contract and waits until the settlement date to take delivery of the crude and to sell it in the spot market. The T-bills are pledged as collateral under the forward contract. If the curve has not shifted in either direction but has maintained its backwardation exactly as before, the investor pockets $5 from the purchase of the crude at 95 and its resale at 100 in addition to the interest she earns on the T-bills. Over the course of one year, the investor will achieve aggregate profits of $20 by rolling the strategy four times quarterly, hence the name of the strategy. In addition to $5 in interest from the T-bills, for an aggregate return on capital of 25%, even without any increase in the spot price of crude. Over long periods of time, increases in spot have typically occurred, of course, if only to keep up with inflation, which has generated a third component of return for the investor. In sum, the total return under this strategy over any one roll of the position equals the table return plus the degree of backwardation, if any, in the curve for the chosen maturity of the forward contract, plus or minus any change in the spot price over the period in question. The chart about to appear shows the aggregate return from rolling the GSCI historically broken down into each of its three components turning now red in the legend and for each decade since 1970 but ending in 2006 for the past decade. Note that the strategy has achieved attractive returns, except during the 90s, but that the sources of this return have changed significantly and have shifted gradually 
from depending mostly during the first two decades shown here on the contribution from the T-bills and the raw returns to depending increasingly on the upward shifts in spot prices in the past decade with little contribution from the T-bills or from the roll. We complete this chapter by bringing to your attention four famous fiascos that have devastated users of commodity derivatives and should serve as warnings of the perils of misusing these instruments just like any other complex financial product. These involve in chronological order the German trading outfit Metal Gesellschaft in the early 90s, the African gold company Ashanti in the late 90s, and more recently the Slovak refiner Slovnaft in 2002, and the Singapore-based China Aviation Oil Company in 2004-2005. Metal Gesellschaft was a leading trader of energy products and other commodities and had developed a solid business involving the sale of oil and natural gas to end users under multiple year fixed price supply contracts. The company hedged these contracts by going long futures on the same commodities, but since these had little liquidity past the shortest tenors, the company adopted a so-called stack and roll strategy under which it would liquidate each period a fraction of the underlying contracts in an amount matching the fraction of overall deliveries it was making to the end user that period under the fixed price supply contract while rolling the remaining number into new contracts. If all had gone well the outstanding number of rolled contracts would have declined to zero at the same time approximately as MG had finished making the last delivery under the supply contract and MG would have remained hedged at all times prior to that. Unfortunately for the company spot prices declined abruptly towards the beginning of the 90s and the forward curve went from a typical backwardation pattern to one in contango. The decline in prices generated huge margin calls against the company on the futures positions, which were not offset by margin calls in favor of the company under the long-term supply contract since the company typically offered these to its customers on an uncollateralized basis. The problem was exacerbated by the reversal from backwardation to contango, which meant that the mark-to-market -market loss on the long futures position exceeded the mark-to-market -market gain on the supply contract. To top it off, management panicked at the worst possible moment forcing the traders to unwind their positions when the losses had reached their maximum. And just before a reversal in prices and in the shape of the curve was about to begin. The company needed a bailout from its parent company and found itself exiting the business. Ashanti's story is simpler, involving forward sales of gold for years into the future by Africa's second largest producer. For the longest time, 
These generated sizable gains for the company, since prices declined steadily for much of the 90s. In part due to liquidations by central banks around the world of large portions of their gold reserves. But in 1999 a number of the largest central banks announced the so-called Washington Agreement in which they committed to an annual limit on further sales to reduce pressure on prices. The market reacted by driving prices up by $60 or so in a matter of days, generating massive mark-to-market -market losses for Ashanti under the forward hedges and giving rise to huge margin calls from the counter company's various counterparties. Margin calls far in excess of the company's available liquidity at that time. Ordinarily, a large gold producer should thrive when prices rise. But with much of the gold in the ground and production committed for several years under the forward hedges, the margin calls proved devastating to the company and were not offset by any corresponding realizable gain from the company's reserves. forcing upon it a massive restructuring that involved, among other things, granting warrants in its equity to its forward counterparties in lieu of the margin that it could not produce. Refiner Slovnaft story begins with a crude linked loan agreement with Merrill Lynch similar in many ways to a transaction we will examine in Chapter 3, in which the borrower paid interest well below the market rate, but agreed to pay additional interest if prices for Brent fell below $15. Prompted by Merrill's sales team and its research analysts, the company had come to believe that further falls in Brent prices much below the current $22 per barrel were unlikely and in any event would widen the company's refining margin and enable it to afford more easily the additional interest payments that would arise. We will learn in Chapter 3 that this arrangement essentially involves the sale by the borrower of options on Brent in this case put options, exposing the borrower to the additional payments if prices fell below the strike of the puts, but earning the borrower in exchange premium income that subsidizes its interest payments when prices are high or moderate. What both parties seem to have taken for granted was that a fall in Brent would necessarily widen the company's refining margin. In fact, prices promptly fell to $10 shortly after the transaction closed, increasing the borrower's payments under the loan quite dramatically. But prices for the company's refined products fell even more compressing margins painfully and jeopardizing the company's ability to service the increased interest payments. Historically, the company had operated under a regulated socialist regime that had normally fixed prices for its output, which may have contributed to the company's optimism that margins would widen if crude prices fell. The company found itself essentially insolvent and turned to its bankers for a capital injection and for proposals on restructuring its portfolio of short options to defer the pain as much as possible. Interestingly, a number of proposals it received shied away from derivatives on crude oil, 
and included instead various suggestions involving crack spread options. The very same options we discussed a little while ago in our overview of spread options. Inevitably, perhaps, the company brought a lawsuit against Merrill Lynch for poor advice in the structuring of the original loan and for encouraging the company in its belief that crude prices were likely to rise rather than fall. China Aviation Oil's misfortunes, finally, involved the sale by the company of substantial amounts of calls on crude, struck around $34 per barrel, to generate premium for use in other aspects of its operations, including in its hedging activities. The start of the bull market for oil around 2004 brought a first wave of losses on the short call positions, which the company addressed by requesting a restructuring of its derivatives portfolio involving an upward reset of the strike of the calls in return for an increase in their notional amount and some other changes. Prices continued, however, their steady climb, turning losses of a few dozen million into aggregate losses of around 550 million US dollars. The company sued its counterparties including Goldman Sachs under a number of legal theories centering on the lack of suitability of the strategies they had proposed including the strategies recommended in the restructuring exercise. Much of the above discussion has involved techniques and risk considerations that run parallel to those for stocks, bonds, rates, or currencies, and are not explored any further in this module. We devote the next chapter to an examination of a number of strategies, perhaps unique to commodities this time, involving the use of commodity derivatives by corporates in the fundraising process. Often the motivation for the use of these derivatives is to lower the financing cost for the borrower, but sometimes it is also to achieve advantageous outcomes from an accounting perspective. Right now, however, we have reached the end of Chapter 2 and of Part 1 of this module.